Thank you, Dr. Morrow, for that very generous introduction. And I'd like to thank the American Society of Biomechanics for this award that um, I'm not sure I deserve, but nevertheless, I'm very pleased to, to get the award. I, it's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. The whole idea of reaching out to students who may previously have been excluded from biomechanics um, and bringing all those talented students into the field. So with that said, um, the presentation I'm going to give today is shown here. I'm going to first of all speak about the power of one person, then get into attributes of faculty members. In fact, that is going to be the majority of the presentation today is, is how I see faculty members best serving the needs of their students. As many of you know, I am from Cape Town, South Africa. I spent almost half my life in South Africa. And there's a key principle or philosophy that comes from South Africa called Ubuntu, which I'm going to share with the audience. And then get into the benefits of networking, the idea of paying it forward for faculty and mentors. And once again, speaking about the cheerleading role, and then lastly, dealing with outreach. So let's start with the power of one. And the award that I'm receiving today is named after Jean Lander Pytel, a faculty member at Penn State University when, oddly enough, I was there as a grad student. And Dr. Jean Lander Pytel focused primarily on undergrad students in engineering. And at the time, I was a graduate student. So I unfortunately did not take any classes uh, that she taught. But um, nevertheless, her influence was very apparent at Penn State University and obviously well beyond that. Just speaking about the power of one, here are some individuals that uh, Dr. Jean Lander Pytel mentored. The first one is Irene Davis, a student who did her PhD the same time that I was at Penn State. Irene graduated from Penn State, entered academia, and ended up being the ASB president from 2008 to 2009. Another person who was mentored by Dr. Jean Lander Pytel was uh, Dr. Jill McNutt Gray also served as ASB president. And the last person I'm going to mention here, just once again, focusing on the power of one person mentoring others. And that person is Mary Rogers, a close colleague of mine. We served for many years on the International Society of Biomechanics. And Dr. Rogers was the ISB president from 2003 to 2005. So here are three examples of females in the field of biomechanics, all of whom would not have obtained what they did obtain were it not for the mentorship from Dr. Jean Lander Pytel. Then personally, speaking about the power of one, I have to mention my own wife, Tracy Davis. I would not be standing here today were it not for her influence on my life. Tracy is a, a, a teacher, um, and because of her role in educating students, especially middle school students, uh, she has um, encouraged me to reach into schools and go to events where uh, K through 12 students are participating and, and interface with them and really show those students why engineering is important. One of the songs that I think best epitomizes her role is Bette Midler's song. <laughs> and for the younger generation who may not know Bette Midler, um, you may recognize the words of the song. So my wife, Tracy, is the wind beneath my wings. But in the context of today's presentation, the role of a faculty member is to be the wind underneath the wings of students. It is because of us that students enter the lab or they enter our educational setting. And because of our influence, we can help them soar once they graduate. It is something I feel very strongly about, that the role of a faculty mentor is to propel students to a higher level. So let me speak about in more detail the, fact that the attributes of faculty members that I think are extremely important. And I'm not the first person to comment on this. Way back in 2002, there was a newsletter from the International Society of Biomechanics. I happened to be the newsletter editor at the time. And one of those um, newsletter articles was written by Dr. Yonming Kim, who at that time was in Seattle. And he did a survey of students in his lab and listed the attributes of faculty members that students consider to be important. So faculty obviously had to have outstanding scholarship. And I'm not going to go through this entire list. You can all see the website listed there. But then he also asked the faculty to list the attributes of students that they considered to be important. 
And once again, there's a long list of attributes. The three that I'm going to focus on here, because I often think that they go are under, under recognized, is to learn from mistakes and failures. I encourage students to make mistakes. I want students to feel empowered to take on difficult classes, difficult courses, and in the process of doing so, struggle, and at the end of the day, come out a, be a better student because they're learning from their mistakes. I think that makes for a better student. Being a team player, th this whole conference, the whole field of biomechanics is really about being a team player because we are working with people from different fields and by learning from each other is how we um, make progress. And obviously the field we're in is very interdisciplinary and that's what I'm expecting from students. So speaking of students, I have two that I would like to mention, Shay Teal and Brittany Summers. I asked them as female PhD students, what attributes they thought were important you know, in terms of what they look for in faculty. And they looked at the list and they agreed with everything in that list, but they also said that in general, female students benefit from a comprehensive overview of career choices and career planning. So it's not just how do you solve complex equations or looking at matrices and uh, Euler transformations. That's all technical stuff, which you know, there are students who benefit from that. But in general, career, uh, female students benefit from the bigger picture, looking at their whole career from the time they, they come to, to university until the time that they leave. Students also have skills that I don't have. The person on the left driving this car is Brittany Summers. And if you zoom in really closely, you will see <laughs> that uh, she may have skills that I don't have, like driving a car with your eyes apparently closed. Um, it was just the timing of the photograph, obviously. <laughs> All right, so with that said, let me get back to this concept of Ubuntu, this principle that um, is well known in South Africa. And I'd like to turn to one of my other heroes to explain more about the principle of Ubuntu. Ubuntu does not mean that people should not enrich themselves. The question therefore is, are you going to do so in order to enable the community around you uh, to be able to improve? These are the important things in life. And if one can do that, we have done something very important which will be appreciated. So once again, the principle of Ubuntu is how can you interact with those around you to make the whole community better? Think of a research lab. How can the faculty member interact with the students in such a manner that it doesn't just benefit the faculty member, it benefits the whole community? Because if you can do that successfully, if you can make your students better and, and the people they interact with better, it's a case of one plus one being more than two. Another one of my heroes, also from South Africa, commented on this principle of Ubuntu. That is the fundamental law of our being. Ubuntu says, not you are human because you think. You are human because you participate in relationship. So you are not faculty because you can think. You are faculty because you are promoting relationship between yourself and students. If I can say, if using um, um, the, the words again from Bishop Tutu. I need you in order for me to be me. I need you to be you to the fullest. So Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, I need you to be you to the fullest. So uh, that, that is a key principle here. I need you to be you to the fullest. So that is what I tell students. I want you not to necessarily pick an area of research that fits my interest, but pick an area of research that allows you to become you to the fullest. So I have a, I have a couple of examples of this. The first one is Dr. Alvaro Mata. Uh, at the moment, he is a chair in biomed biomedical engineering at, um, in England. And way back, in uh, 1998, 1999, was well, just after that, Alvaro Marta came to my lab. I was at the Cleveland Clinic at the time, and I was also the only person doing diabetic foot research at the Cleveland Clinic. 
This is prior to Dr. Peter Kavanaugh joining the department. So at that time, Alvaro Mata came to me. I knew that his master's was on the topic of diabetic foot ulceration. And so he sat in my office and he said, could I potentially do my PhD with you? And I said, well, before we talk about that, Alvaro, what would drive you? What stimulates you beyond anything else? And he said, well, to be honest, it's not necessarily diabetic foot research, but I am interested in biomaterials and I'm interested in tissue engineering. And I said, Alvaro, with that background, I can find other mentors for you at the Cleveland Clinic. So I put him in touch with uh, colleagues, Dr. George Mushler and others who, who became his PhD committee. And Alvaro Mata, to say that he excelled is an understatement. He had numerous publications resulting from his PhD. He was recognized by the president of Costa Rica with their highest award for scientific research. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because none of this would have been possible if my response to Alvaro Mata, I'm not saying this is my doing, but simply if Alvaro Mata had chosen to do his PhD in an area that was a natural stepping stone beyond his master's, he would not have become Alvaro Mata to the fullest. He would not have entered the field of biomaterials and tissue engineering. And so sometimes I think it's, it behoves us as faculty to look beyond our own lab and, and look at the student's point of view and what what drives them and, and what, what area can they excel in themselves. Another example, um, she's now Dr. Melissa Boswell from Stanford University. She did her undergraduate research with me and uh, then applied for an NSF graduate fellowship, which she received, but I encouraged her to look beyond Northeast Ohio <laughs> and, and look nationally and find a lab that really interested her. Now, Dr. Boswell is a remarkable person. She also became the, the student rep on the International Society of Biomechanics Council. She created this initiative called Biomechanics on Our Minds, or BOOM. It is going viral. If any of you out there Google BOOM and, and podcasts, you'll see all these individuals that uh, Melissa and others in her group have interviewed. And it is taking biomechanics to another level. Once again, it's not something that I could have um, succeeded in, in terms of mentoring her. This was a case of encouraging Melissa to spread her wings and go elsewhere and become Melissa Boswell to the fullest. And, and that also entailed her dancing across the um, graduation stage with her advisor, Dr. Scott Delp at Stanford uh, not too long ago. All right, so switching from Ubuntu and um, moving on to networking. If I go back to the individuals who were directly mentored by Dr. Jean Lander Patel, uh, here's a group of five of them. Uh, Melissa Gross, Wendy Murray, Jill McNutt Gray, Irene Davis, and Mary Rogers. These were the five, I will say, original members of the American Society of Biomechanics who were female, who led the way for all those others to follow. And if you speak to any of them, I'm good friends with these individuals, and ask them what was it that allowed them to get to where they got to, it's that they would say networking was extremely important. It's hard to imagine when you look at how many members of the American Society of Biomechanics nowadays are female, but, but back then it was less than, you know, less than 10, just a handful of individuals. So I'll give, I'll give you an example from my own research, Dr. Christine Weber. She did her master's with me on the topic of biomechanics of prosthetic sockets, looking at thermal issues with socket design for amputee patients. And um, we were fortunate to go to another me meeting of the American Society of Biomechanics held in 2013 in Nebraska. And I said to Christine, this is an opportunity for you to network. Who would you like to meet with? And, and she said to me that she would like to do a PhD in a clinical environment. And I looked across the room, and there was Dr. Ken Kaufman from the Mayo Clinic. And I said, let me introduce you to Dr. Kaufman. So we did that. They ended up speaking together for a long time. And if I jump to the final conclusion, Christina did her PhD with, with Dr. Kaufman at the Mayo Clinic, graduated and, and is now at the Food and Drug Administration. So once again, the power of networking is, is awesome. And, and going to conferences like the American Society of Biomechanics allows us to network, but the role of the mentor here is critically important because we know typically who the individuals are in the audience who are looking for students and who have research interests that match the students that we're, that we're mentoring. So it is a responsibility that I think mentors have to make those introductions. I know I'm jumping from topic to topic here, but here's another one that I feel very strongly about, and that is paying it forward. And what I mean by that is that every day we are inundated with emails. And I'm gonna suggest that before you simply hit the delete button, you look at the email and say, is this something that could benefit one of my students? And I'm gonna go through some examples just to show you the, the breadth of this. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. There are programs offered by the American Society of Biomechanics and the International Society of Biomechanics, all geared towards paying it forward 
and preparing the next generation. We are very excited about an opportunity that's been funded by the National Science Foundation to encourage individuals with disabilities to enter the field of rehabilitation research. And the reason why I'm saying this fits into paying it forward is because as faculty or researchers, we can learn from individuals with disabilities and fine tune the research that we do to make it more appropriate and more applicable to really solving the problems. So by engaging with individuals with disabilities, in a collaborative, interdisciplinary manner, we are paying it forward and, and enabling things to occur in the future that really would not be possible if we simply did not reach beyond our own lab. Being a cheerleader, this is also a way of paying it forward. I have been very fortunate to have uh, two individuals who, who were my graduate advisors, uh, Dr. Kit Vaughan and Dr. Peter Kavanagh. Both of them, I think, epitomize the idea of paying it forward and preparing the next generation. So I was, I was talking about emails and, and not deleting them. So here are some examples. I received this email from, I guess, a colleague at Cleveland State University saying that they're looking for students to apply for an interdisciplinary program dealing with molecular medicine. And, and I figured, well, I don't know that this applies, but I sent this to one of my students, Alexi Malinas, who applied for the fellowship and she obtained the fellowship. So it paid for two years of her research. Once again, there was an email that I could very easily have deleted, but uh, I guess chose not to. Another email from the American Society of Biomechanics was one that related to students forming new chapters at their own university. Forwarded that information onto Shay Teal, who applied for our university to become a, an American Society of Biomechanics chapter, and it was approved, and Shay is now the president of our new Cleveland State University chapter uh, that ties in with American Society of Biomechanics. Here's another email. Uh, Jesse Martin is a PhD student in my lab who initially joined my lab with the express intention of getting some graduate coursework under her belt and then going to work in industry. So I came across an email thread that related to an opportunity to collaborate with the Cleveland Clinic and, and apply for a fellowship. And Jessie did, she was accepted and she obtained that fellowship. And that's an example of an opportunity where one plus one is definitely bigger than two. Because Jessie now has access to the clinical resources at the Cleveland Clinic, as well as the technical resources here at our university. Another strange one, <laughs> I got this email regarding um, student members of the Board of Trustees. I sent this to Brittany Summers, and uh, I'll cut a long story short, she applied, was uh, appointed by Governor DeWine in the state of Ohio to become the student rep at Cleveland State University. Um, another, I'm, I'm just getting, these are all different examples, but I, I, the, the common theme here is that before you hit the delete button as a faculty member, ask yourself, is this an email that could benefit a student and cannot use us to pay it forward and prepare the next generation. This one is for another student, Taylor Street, related to a Neovation initiative in Northeast Ohio, spanning multiple universities. And they were looking for a graduate engineering student to be the vice president uh, and oversee the engineering aspects of this initiative. And Taylor applied and she obtained it. So finally, I, I can't um, end only by talking about graduate students. <laughs> I also want to talk about um, outreach and the fact that if we really want to prepare the next generation, we need to start in middle school and high school. And so this initiative that, that we created, it's called Best Medicine. It stands for Bridging Engineering, Science and Technology in Medicine. And if ever you want to motivate children, sixth graders, seventh graders, whatever, to become interested in biomechanics, ask them to speak to their grandparents, their uncles about any physical limitation that they may have, and then ask the students to solve that problem. And you'll find all kinds of novel approaches for having wheelchairs that go upstairs and ways of opening up peanut butter jars. But really you're motivating students at the young age to think about engineering and think about biomechanics. So finally, I just want to make some, um, or pay credit to where credit is due. I have been unbelievably fortunate in my career to be mentored by uh, outstanding individuals. I've said that it, it, it benefits everybody to reach across barriers. Uh, so here are four, uh, three, four individuals who have mentored me, two female, two male, two individuals of color, two white people, two engineers, two clinicians. I think if you ever want to have a, a mixture of individuals mentoring you, you could not ask for a better mixture than the four people represented here. And I feel very fortunate to have learned from every one of them. And also finally just to acknowledge the, the individuals who I think nominated me for the Jean Lander Pytel Award, Melissa Boswell, Brittany Summers, and Shay Teal. Once again, it is my desire for you to be you to the fullest, all three of you and all the other students who I've been fortunate to, to mentor. And, and just speaking about mentor, I can't end on any other note, but pay, pay credit to Jean Lander Pytel, after whom this award is named.
Thank you.